wheat, barley, peas, lentils, rice, flax, rye, millet and beans. These are many of our fundamental crops, foods which propelled us into living in permanent settlements engaged in farming and agriculture. With just these, we can ferment, stew, bake, grind and bulk up meat dishes. And when some or all of these are cultivated in different places around the world, it changed our perception of the very land on which we live. Of course, dates and specifics vary greatly, from Andean uh, cultivation of potatoes and tomatoes to rice and soybeans in China, but generally land becomes seen as a resource for cultivation and survival, judged by its capacity to feed people, as opposed to its natural ability to provide berries, wild grains and sources of meat. This is all to say that the growing of plants is among the most important cultural concerns in human history. Especially as, without plant cultivation and domestication, large-scale animal domestication becomes a pipe dream. But in worlds which play by D&D's rules, there is a third level spell that many believe supercharges any agrarian economy. Plant growth. In the fifth edition of D&D, you can cast it in one of two ways. One, you make plants in a quite large area overgrown, to the point that it is four times as difficult to pass by them. This is frankly quite potent on its own and has some implications for revitalising near-dead forests, I increasing lumber, or general greenery yield in an area, and even in warfare. But we're really here to talk about the second effect of plant growth. If you spend eight hours casting it, you enrich the land. All plants in a half mile radius centered on a point within range become enriched for one year. The plants yield twice the normal amount of food when harvested. Firstly, as a technicality, if you manage to gather up all of your kingdom's potatoes that are sprouting and going to be replanted in the next year, in just a half mile radius, you will single-handedly double the entire kingdom's potato harvest for one single third level spell slot, as they're technically plants. This strategy does rely on the plant being easier and smaller to store in its younger stages, and also relies on strong logistical distribution methods and a centralised farming authority. This is maybe technically possible in a feudal economy, but generally this kind of seedling warehouse loophole isn't terribly practical. Although I do maintain that for certain crops in an authoritarian enough developed state, this is the most efficient option. Farmers would be distributed their germinating beans and potatoes, as well as potentially germinated seeds from other centralised nurseries, allowing the regime to bless this food for good harvest for cheap, and to potentially sabotage dissenters by uh, just choosing not to use the spells on the seedlings distributed to them. Under this system, plant nurseries may actually be a practical agricultural technique after all, as opposed to being invented at some point in the 1700s to serve modern landscaping and gardening functions. But this is just one specific way that culture could interact with doubly yielding crops Let's look at how this spell changes agriculture, and not just from a Western medieval perspective either. So for much of human history, and around much of the world in many of our spaces, land is not owned in the modern sense, as in a price is put on a certain parcel of land and it is sold for the temporary slash perpetual use of the person who buys it. It's a weird system in itself that we have in modernity, and it is not historically universal by any means. It is generally true that the farmland around a settlement that supports that settlement is worked by up to 90% of the general population. Farming is and has been throughout history a community 
project. The wise ones decide what is planted and when it should be harvested. The strong ones perform the manual labour and the skilled ones make or maintain tools or train or drive animals. Essentially, the tribe or village or town is engaged in a constant project to feed those who cannot or do not work the fields. Being young children, heavily pregnant folks, wet nurses, seamstresses and the like. Indeed, most traditionally male jobs, like building, smithing and soldiering, were either seasonal or highly engaged in supporting the process of farming. Campaigns in wars were fought once the seeds went in the ground and were ideally over by autumn, at least in Western Europe, for the harvest. Otherwise, soldiers tended to get antsy, as there wouldn't be enough time to harvest food, prepare it, and prepare themselves for the winter. But a key feature of non-feudal systems is that productivity really is an obligation only to one's own community. The community suffers when the crops suffer, and everyone in the local area suffers too when this happens. However, in a feudal system, the locals still suffer, but they still must also give a portion of their harvest as payment to their local liege lord. The lord suffers too, don't get me wrong, but his suffering is rarely malnutrition. It is usually increased obligations to his superiors. In essence, the feudal system spreads suffering from local settlements through this long chain of seniority through financial, not often practical, suffering, because the main draw of being made a lord was that your renters paid you dues from the harvest. Of course, this is a gross simplification, but it results in two different styles of agricultural thinking. A feudal system holds productivity as its overarching goal, whereas a tribal or communitarian agrarian project has self-sufficiency as its core value. Communitarian farmers don't necessarily need to justify their own worth working the lands that they are allowed to live on. That's the key distinction. Yes, most nations in history required settlements to send resources, money, soldiers or crops to support the nation's perpetuation, but the introduction of the Lord as a profit-seeking middleman who has technical control over the land creates weird dynamics on a local level. It does mean that in this strange it does mean that in this relatively strange feudal system, uh, the development of new practices is kind of a necessity. It's no coincidence that Britain moves from a fallow and active field model to a three field model into the Norfolk system, all while landlords control the fields to a certain extent. But it is also true that every single one of these advancements made in a fantasy world is compounded by the presence of plant growth. All efficiency savings are amplified, at least technically. You see, we're missing one key piece of the puzzle. You need a fifth level druid or bard or a ninth level ranger for anyone to benefit from this spell. Many people even suggest that druids might choose not to help with agriculture due to the necessity of land clearance and the introduction of homogenous, non-wild species. But I would suggest that if you can find a druid enclave, they may in fact be more than happy to bless your fields if it means less dramatic expansion and fewer slash and burn agricultural regions or resets. But the central question really is, who's paying for it? However rare spellcasters may be in your world, there are still precious few people who will be willing to spell, spend a full workday on a single ritual while using up their most potent magic without some compensation. A travelling bard may negotiate a feasting day or free food and ale in their honour when they pass by, or a parcel of land on which to build a house. A druid may require compensation, useful products like rope or woolen garments, or the promise of mutual aid. The, the villagers act as defenders if their enclave is threatened. It is possible that the lord to peasant or serf relationship is also fundamentally changed by this. 
Perhaps lords in a certain region are those who have this power to double yields. In return, the community offers them an impressive share of the field's profits, and they get to live in the local manor, as long as they continue to enrich the fields and protect the farmers with their magical skills. This is in a very similar way that the landed knight had responsibility for protecting and defending their lands. But in the traditional feudal system, where your lord has no magic but a good family name or at least being pretty rich, who's paying? Does the polity want to be in debt to another lord, a druid? ranger or bard who offers some magical protection? It doesn't seem like the worst idea, but it is still actually risky. After all, doubling your yield means absolutely nothing if your crops end up all diseased one year. Then you've got two governors come a-calling, a landed knight and a bard, who both want their due. So should the lord pay? Well, safe permitted travel through the lord's lands and a room at the manor is a decent benefit for a travelling magic user, but it is also true that in an environment where a local lord is seeking to gain power and money from their holdings, paying large upfront fees is not very viable, at least every year. Debts could be taken on, but to incur a debt in the, for the promise of future food in a year is also risky considering the disease angle that I talked about earlier. And this is really where things start to fall apart. To put it bluntly, the division of land into discrete parcels causes massive problems. Tenant farmers who may choose to self-fund this service may find that their holdings are in too strange a configuration, perhaps too thin or too spread apart, to gain a full benefit of this spell. Lords who may choose to get all of their land blessed in the same way may find that some of their neighbours' land got blessed too. Cue the most human of problems. Jealousy. Much like the legacy of colonialism, it turns out that parceling land as a series of geometric shapes leads to some people feeling left out. And no matter how you arrange them, a series of circles will have either significant overlap or significant dead space in between them. In either case, the ones paying for this service will find dead zones or zones when their neighbours and rivals receive free benefits from your investments. Designing a system from the ground up to include this would likely land on farming models significantly divorced from medieval Europe. It is likely that the value of this technique would be more immediately seen in a non-feudal world first. We'd see itinerant spellcasters stopping in once a year at settlements to bless their harvest, probably doing this year round, likely originally casting the spell in the village centre to enrich the surrounding fields. This is likely easy enough to cover a village of 200 people's farming projects. Crucially, in non-feudal systems, a village as a collective would band together to pay the spellcaster, perhaps a feast day on their arrival. Maybe travelling bards get a reputation for indulgence. As fat as a travelling bard could be a lovely idiom to highlight that in such a world. As settlements grow, it is likely that the spell starts to be cast outside the civic centre, in a large collection of farmland often reserved for this purpose. Markers or walls might indicate the area of a mile diameter or roughly 500 acres, a rough circle outside town where tradition dictates the itinerant spellcaster must cast the spell. The next development is likely a farmhouse or some sort of farm warehouse buildings uh, made to sit at the centre of one such circle. As a farmer, having your own vegetable patch produce at twice the rate is a lovely bonus for moving into the middle of nowhere. Um, as we start seeing multiple circle farms start to interlock. Ideally, each has a well somewhere near the centre as well, as the irrigation of circular fields is are more complex than linear ones. In fallow seasons, perhaps these mile-wide circles are set aside for animals to roam relatively freely. So walls are established around these particular mile-wide circles too. Planting becomes strangely simple too. 
using a central rod and various lengths of rope, planting in concentric circles just makes sense, especially when an ox can plough in a circle simply by walking against the tension of a taut rope. And here's the kicker. There is precedent for circular farmland. Even into the modern day, we find circular fields in the Great Plains of the US. Why? Well, they're large flat regions which are traditionally not terribly productive and traditionally notoriously hard to irrigate with traditional techniques. So, some clever clogs in the 1940s decided to create a movable rotating sprinkler powered by aquifers under the ground that rolls around the fields in a circle. Flat, dry, traditionally unproductive land is transformed then into one of the most efficient farming operations imaginable. And all it took was a large sprinkler arm on wheels and some flat land. I have always been of the opinion that D&D works at its absolute best in a frontier society, but never did I expect to feel so vindicated by a long sprinkler arm in the Dust Bowl. I genuinely think that this sprinkler system, kind of a rolling pivot-based aqueduct, would be the most important invention a designer in a D&D world could ever create, at least for flat land. My point is really this. Plant growth is so potent for world building that it must shape our designs. It doubles field yield without doubling required labour or space, excepting at harvest season. Essentially, other than big community efforts around harvest time, 90% of people no longer need to be working the farms. Larger populations can be supported, with those folks free to work in other professions, studying, crafting as merchants, or perhaps in industry. And that's the thing, a food surplus was a massive factor in creating the British Industrial Revolution. And if a settlement is actually sustainable without the use of plant growth, then the use of this spell automatically creates a huge surplus for that settlement. This spell might even change the agrarian landscape from smaller, squarer, parceled off tenant holdings to a more community-focused farm, reliant not on a local lord, but a local spellcaster for their protection. Circular fields, ploughs with variable curves on them, and fewer territorial walls getting in the way of everything. Heck, that engineer who is the first to properly irrigate flat, dry plains of land might end up being the richest man in the world. But I think I'll leave you with just a few questions. First, could germinated seed nurseries actually make sense for, say, cities to send out to satellite villages and satellite farms? Secondly, what happens when the caster doesn't come one year? An adventure in the offing, perhaps? Third, are there actual serious practical implications to fields being quite often circular or semicircle themed? Fourth, is there any way that massive population growth and a subsequent industrialization doesn't occur under a reliable version of this system. And lastly, what about the other use of plant growth? For my quick perspective on that one, well, our ancestors spent thousands of hours building up defenses like moats, ditches and hills and barricades to slow oncoming enemies down. An instantaneous reduction of enemy speed by four times is absurdly powerful with, for any defence which has any ranged capabilities, especially as it technically stacks on top of other difficult terrain or traps. This is an excellent defensive tool to protect fortifications, but its best use is to utterly disrupt any coordinated charge, leaving holes in a charging line, which is strategically disadvantageous to say the least. Or you can use multiple castings, as it's not concentration, to section off advantageous approaches to your army's position. Militarily, it's probably more impactful than fireball, at least in large scale conflicts. So yeah, plant growth should change your world in multiple ways. Thank you so much for watching. I, I hope you've enjoyed this deep dive into 
agricultural history and a single D&D spell. I, I honestly I have no idea how I have an audience. But thank you for sticking around my nerdy ass. Um, let me know what spell I should be tackling next. But with all that said, I've been Tom, otherwise known as the Grungeon Master. Thank you again so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.